When I was a little girl, I used to love watching clips of Saturday Night Live. Those videos of Bill Hader, Seth Meyers, Kristen Wiig, and Andy Samberg felt like home to me, but they had no familiarity. I know that doesn't make any sense, so allow me to explain. Despite harboring an undying love for comedy and comedy performance, I never really considered it a viable career option as a child. Never even crossed my mind. Because I didn't see myself represented on screen, I wasn't afforded the luxury of dreaming without limits that most other children were. Comedy is already so daunting and out of reach for the average person, but for an Indian girl like me who doesn't fit into most standards of conventional Hollywood beauty, it seemed impossible. When I was asked what I wanted to be when I was a little girl, I used to give the stereotypical answers that I thought would make the people around me most happy. Doctor, engineer, entrepreneur. When I briefly expressed an interest in film school at age 16, my parents were very frank with me. Hollywood has no room for people that look like us. Now, I wanna be extremely clear, I don't blame my parents. They were just trying to protect me from what they thought would be certain failure. They, like me, didn't see anyone that looked like us on an American screen, so it didn't make sense to them when I asked to be one of them. My family wasn't alone in feeling like our options were limited. Across the board, academic literature largely confirms the phenomenon that I experienced at home. According to a Nielsen report that came out in 2016, the average American consumes about five hours and 15 minutes of television per day. There's a quote that I feel really embodies my stance on representation in media by Kelly Greenhill of the Los Angeles Times. She says, intentionally or not, for better or for worse, fiction can play a very real role in the construction of political reality. Today, I'll be talking about how media representation affects self-perception. To prepare for this talk, I read a chapter of the book Arabs and Muslims in the Media, Race and Representation After 9-11, in which the author, Evelyn El Sultani, discusses at length how Muslim representation in the media directly affected the perception of them by the general population. The example she gives is the TV show 24, which came under fire by the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, for its insensitive portrayal of Muslims as terrorists. In the book, she quotes a former army interrogator who admitted that a lot of soldiers in Iraq mimicked what they saw on TV by waterboarding, mock torturing, and mock executing Iraqi people. This is a more extreme example, but academic literature aligns with the notion that people's perceptions of humanity are impacted by media representation. In a study conducted by Chapman University, professors reviewed 345 of the most popular TV shows and used a multi-level model to measure racial and ethnic perceptions of white audiences. Results revealed severe underrepresentation of Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans, and a tendency to depict ethnic minorities stereotypes typically. Black people are portrayed as criminal and aggressive. Latino depictions often revolve around themes of sexuality, criminality, subservience, or intellectual ineptitude. There's so little representation of Asians and Native Americans that no conclusive statement can be made about how their representation affects perception. The same study found that positive representation can have pro-social effects, but only temporarily. For example, seeing figures like Oprah Winfrey or Beyonce can have a short-term positive effect on the way that people perceive African Americans. This goes to show just how deeply ingrained negative perceptions are in our culture. Furthermore, studies have shown that a lack of representation has a negative impact on the mental health of Indian men and that a lack of representation of darker skinned women on TV directly correlates with the increased popularity of skin lightening creams. I want to take this opportunity to discuss my own personal experience. Though I wanted to write for TV and do stand up, I never saw any other Indian people doing it. I felt like a black sheep. All my Indian friends were dead set on pursuing careers in IT and medicine and business, but I never really felt a calling to those professions in the way that they did. In comedy, I found solace. I watched stand-up comedy to forget that I was totally alone in the world and to find laughter in my darkest moments. I felt a sort of connection to these comedians. They may not have known who I was, but to me, they were my closest friends. Then when I was around 15, I discovered the TV show Totally Biased with W. Kamau Bell, which had two Indian correspondents, Hari Kondabalu and Aparna Nancherla, both of whom have Netflix specials now. Seeing them present witty takes and making audiences laugh felt validating to me. Around this time, I developed an affinity for Amar Rahman, an Australian comic who is also South Asian by blood. His spicy hot political takes and open discussion of racial disparities comforted me. 
He did not cater to white audiences, he spoke truth to power. I also became extremely fond of Hasan Minaj, whose energy captivated his audiences and compelled them to hang on to every word. That's what made me want to be a stand-up comedian, knowing that I could have that influence on a stage, that I could make people laugh with just a combination of words, and that my cultural identity wasn't a hindrance or a barrier, but a strength. It made me feel empowered. On Twitter, I asked people to tell me about a time that they felt validated and represented on screen and got over 700 responses. A significant part of the representation discussion is centered around fat people. One respondent on Twitter told me that she was traumatized by the character Fat Monica on Friends, a trauma that she didn't fully process and heal from until she watched A.D. Bryant's Shrill, which is about a fat woman in New York City learning to assert herself amidst the city's media, environment, and ruthless diet culture. I've struggled with eating disorders, but this last year, I've never been more in love with my body. That's the power of representation. Although more recently, the portrayal of cops in the media has rightfully come under scrutiny, I still feel like it's worth mentioning that another good example of positive portrayal in television, which is also a personal favorite of mine, is Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is a comedy show about a group of ragtag cops based in Brooklyn, New York. A lot of people who responded expressed an affinity for the show, mainly for the careful and empathetic manner with which it treats issues like sexuality, gun violence, and police brutality. One character in particular, Rosa Diaz, comes out as bisexual. This was met with widespread positive reception, as mainstream television still falters in terms of bisexual representation. Sex education was another one that came up a lot in the survey. Sex education follows Otis, the introverted son of a radically progressive sex therapist, as he sets up an underground sex therapy clinic for his high school classmates who have questions they don't feel comfortable asking adults. Sex education is critically acclaimed and has been praised for its portrayal of sexuality, race, adoption, and so forth. One example that stood out to me personally was its portrayal of an Indian girl having pleasurable sex. So often in the media, Indian girls are portrayed as prude or nerdy. Challenging these stereotypes is paramount to dismantling them and portraying people as complex individuals. Sex education is unique in that it doesn't make teen awkwardness or angst the punchline, rather portrays it as a natural step in human development. Unlike most other coming-of-age shows, sex education depicts a wide array of stories across races, sexualities, and genders. I could sit here and rattle off good examples of representation for the rest of the speech, but I won't do that. Rather, I would like to talk to you about what all these examples that I've given to you and other examples that I have not given to you have in common. Though these examples span a variety of genres, there is one thing that they all share, and that is compassion. Compassion for the self and the issues that they face, not othering because of an obstacle, but empowering through an unchangeable part of one's identity. It is the media that molds our value system, so compassion goes a really, really long way. Acceptance that everyone would like to see themselves positively represented on TV. Another thing that all of these have in common is that the characters in question undeniably have flaws. Character flaws make characters more accessible and humanize them. These characters should be free to be flawed without it being reflective of their whole identity or the entire community that they belong to. So what is the takeaway from all of this? The examples that I've shared with you today show the power of letting people tell their own story or at least treating the characters that they do write with empathy and mindfulness. The industry can only change from within, and as we watch the diversification of television and film, it is important to remember that only those with power can give a chance to those who would not get opportunities otherwise. So how can normal people like you and I prompt change? The answer is actually far simpler than you think. Just show up and show out for the works of art that tell diverse stories. Follow people online who have expressed a vested interest in pursuing a career in the entertainment industry specifically to give a spotlight to stories that wouldn't be told otherwise. Watch TV shows and movies with unconventional lead and ensemble characters. Show the people in power that investing in diversity will always pay off. On My Block, a teen dramedy and Netflix original TV show about a group of kids growing up in inner city Los Angeles was the most binge-watched Netflix show in 2018, despite the fact that the streaming service did not initially give the show much advertising support when it premiered. One Day at a Time, a TV show about a Cuban immigrant family, received a score of 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, despite criticism that it was too politically correct and divisive. 
Hustlers, a movie about strippers who scammed investment bankers of millions of dollars, had the biggest opening weekend for a movie starring women of color. The power of the internet is not to be underestimated either. The rise of the digital era brings with it a new platform that is rife with opportunities. I myself was scouted by a comedy management team for TV writing because of my large online following. My good friend Aida Osman was hired as a writer for both Big Mouth and Betty on HBO because the executive producers of both shows felt that her online presence fit the voice of the TV show extremely well. With the power of our voices, we can elevate people and stories that we want to see the most and push Hollywood in the right direction so that one day our children can look on the screen and see themselves for who they really are, complex and worthy of love regardless of race, gender, disability, or sexuality, so that one day a little girl like me doesn't have to feel weird or out of place because of her desire to chase her dreams. Thank you.